space over n. This is a nice feature, but it's non-robust, as we have seen, right? It's non-robust. But the point here is that any classifier who uses that feature, no matter what classifier, it can be the most sophisticated neural net. As soon as they use this feature, I can fool them. So people have observed and practiced that adversarial examples that fool one classifier will tend to fool many other classifiers a lot. I mean, there is this kind of universality of adversarial attacks. And you can see this here in this simple model even, right? It is uh, independent of the classifier in some sense, as long as the classifier uses that non-robust feature, OK? And uh, um, so it's universal. And there's another. So what they prove in this paper, which this is just to remind you, this is Is it 2019? I forgot what it was, but CLR, I think. Anyway, what they show, and it's not very hard to show, but that's quite a theorem anyway. Um, they basically show that any classifier, any cla on this distribution here. Uh, so let's on this distribution with the parameters that I had and epsilon being um, of order uh, two eta. Okay. So if you allow two eta adversarial perturbations. Then any classifier, any classifier, and you can see how the proof goes, right, already. But any classifier um, with standard accuracy, standard accuracy, so when it's non robust, accuracy at least one minus delta, okay, any such uh, classifier has robust accuracy. Accuracy. So in, if it wants to be accurate against these epsilon perturbations, an L infinity has robust accuracy no more than, so when you put all the p's in all my 10% and you make it precise, it's p over 1 minus p times delta. Okay. So this is basically everything I just gave you here as an intuition. You can actually make this formal. Okay. So that's nice. And then they also observe, so they here they want to first, in this paper, they they initiate the study of robust and non-robust features, but they also want to advocate for adversarial training. And the way they do it, there's another thing they prove is, um, if you take just a support vector machine, just uh, the simplest model that we can think of, and train it on this distribution, on this one that we've seen, then it will um, actually learn, put itself into this kind of bad, uh, bad kind of minimum, in the bad sense that it's non-robust. So, if you just train an SVM with this distribution, so the simplest kind of machine that we can think of, it will end up learning this uh, non-robust feature here. You can just show it, right? I mean, it's work, but you can show it. Uh, and you can also show that if you optimize this SVM for the non-robust loss, right, it will be able to, um, uh, you know, it will be able to learn with probability p. Oh, sorry, one minus p. So it will kind of pick out this feature. Okay, so it's even not only here, this is a result kind of any classifier, but they also show if you actually do SGD on, a, on an SVM or on a support vector machine on this problem, in one case it will find this, this feature and in the other it will find that feature, right? So this is nice because in the linear model, basically everything works like they want it to work and like it tends to work uh, uh, these days. Is that clear? All right, and so this is nice. Um, and so people after that, uh, there's a huge industry. So then they advocate adversarial training, which I have explained last lecture, where you do a bit of robust perturbation, you train your weights a little bit, you perturb again, you train, you perturb, you per uh, train in order to solve this saddle point problem that I've, uh, I've written on the board. Um, I think I need the, uh, I want to just show a picture, but then there was a huge industry of people trying to improve adversarial training. I mean, like, there's a constant um, effort to do so, uh, which is understandable. I will show you in a second where the state of the art is, or at least last I looked, whatever, a couple months ago or something, um, because it's not, not great. Um, but so people try to use all kinds of intuitions built on this and also other intuitions um, to try to optimize in a robust way during adversarial training. Am I supposed to wait? Is it just yeah. magic? Okay. Ah, there you go. So ignore this here. So this is a, uh, from a paper by Zhang et al., uh, which is actually from Michael Jordan's group. So of course, the optimizers, the, op the optimization people, 
have looked at this problem too. They like uh, seven points problems. And so the intuition here is, right, you want to optimize in a robust way. Uh, and so if you just have a standard optimizer, he, the standard optimizer just cares about these points it wants to classify, right? They're kind of the, the blue against the yellow. So it will find decision boundaries that tend to be within the robust L infinity cube, right? Just like a little bit what we've seen. And so we want to create a robust, a robust um, kind of optimizer that builds like kind of it optimizes its decision boundaries a bit bigger, okay, intuition. And so I think the the, the real so state, so there was adversarial training, and then there's, uh, I'm just gonna give you one of these ideas, there's what's called trades. This is from this Michael Jordan group, from this paper here, where they basically do adversarial training, but they optimize, they use a slightly better loss function when they optimize their, um, in the inner loop, okay? Let me find it, here. So they, they split the error basically into two pieces, the kind of the normal error, the standard error, and some sort of robust error. And this robust error is supposed to, let's ignore it. Um, the robust error is supposed to push you away from this kind of, push these boundaries away apart, okay? So now I'm just being geometric. Of course, they have all kinds of reasonings, and then they relax it. So in the loss function in this trades um, algorithm, which is kind of state of the art, or was at least for a while, um, in adversarial training, so it's it's the loss function, one of these two loss functions I've shown during adversarial training. So these trades loss function is uh, basically minimizing, right, our parametric model, if you wish, in expectation here over the data, um, where we uh, basically we have uh, two terms. We have L um, um, cross entropy that we are used to, so our function with respect to the label, right, kind of standard accuracy, so it's a bit of a trade-off between standard and robust. They are kind of trying to address this trade-off between standard and robust accuracy. And then they do this inner loop here, where we have the perturbation within the epsilon ball around x, okay? And here they do some sort of cross-entropy term between f of x, <coughs> and f of x prime, right, uh, over lambda. Oh no, the lambda is outside, sorry. Let, let's just, sorry. So let's just say one of the lambda here, all right? So basically, um, they wanna make this a little more uh, precise, this trade-off between standard and robust accuracy, and they put this into their optimization problem by, first of all, asking it to optimize properly, but in the inner loop where they kind of want to, the adversity is kind of pushing the, you know, this kind of, this term intuitively pushes the decision boundary a bit away, okay? So just be, I'm just being intuitive here. But this was, um, so when, when adversarial training came up in 2018, um, I think there was a New York's competition, a big one, where they said, okay, beat the state of the art, improve adversarial training. And there were 2,000 entries or more uh, for that. And it's this trades, loss function that won kind of this competition and resulted then in this paper, okay? And then there are many other loss functions. Um, and I, I generally the field has, has a lot of developments, but I want to point out one thing which might be interesting to this community. So this is a paper from 2020 by uh, Coulter, so that's Carnegie Mellon Group, um, where they observe something uh, that is different, as I mentioned already, between standard training and adversarial training. So whichever adversarial training you do, what they observe is, right, in the standard, so look at red and green, this is the stuff you're used to. So we train, we train, we train, this is our um, training error, maybe there's a, a piece where we change the learning rate or something, anyway, it goes down, but also even once we fit fully, our test error also goes down, something like this, right? We keep, we keep improving in generalization, basically. I mean, there's double descent. I don't wanna go, the point here is, quantitatively, when you do adversarial training, first of all, there's a bigger generalization gap, right? I mean, between orange and, uh, and, and blue. But also, they observe that there is a kind of a sweet spot, and then the thing gets worse again. So there's actually, um, standard training and adversarial training have qualitatively different behaviors 
when it comes to generalization and double descent and all that stuff. There's, again, there's literature in this. I, I just want to give you a teaser of what there is in case you want to study this with your, uh, the tools that you have. But the point that they make is, uh, very sadly, is that they say, you know, now it's really about early stopping. Now it's really, it's good to know where early stopping is, is important here because we really don't quite know what's happening. And then they basically show all this stuff, trades, uh, the serial training, all these basically become the same when you put early stopping into the equation. So with early stopping, they show all these leaderboards, all these advantages go away if you just stop at the right moment, roughly. I mean, I'm, I'm being very, I'm oversimplifying, but roughly this is what they, um, what they do with these people. So um, again, there's lots of research here. Um, I wanted to say something about the state of the art, but I want and then go back to the, maybe I'll do it the other way around because I kind of build up to it. So just to say here that Adderall, this is really one of these open problems. It's not something where we have, you know, it works and then we just need to understand it. This is now, it doesn't work and we don't understand it, okay? And so just to give you an idea, I found this in a very recent survey. Uh, let's see what this is. Um, these are all, all kinds of, they, 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 this is all kinds of way of do adversarial training. Okay, each of them is some sort of adversarial training. And you know, people have observed, for instance, adversarial training is data hungry. Let's generate data, unlabeled data, and throw it in in order to increase. There's all kinds of um, you know, techniques, but look at, the, look at the performance, right? I mean, it's sometimes CIFAR, sometimes ImageNet, and this is the robust accuracy. I mean, and look, look at its numbers. I mean, it's horrible. I mean, look at this, right? I mean, this is 45. This is adversarial training, and then with all the sophistication in the world, this is MNIST. So MNIST I mentioned is a bit easier because it's kind of binary, so it's not so hard to, to be robust in MNIST, but this is the state of the art. This is horrendous, right? I mean, I, mean, I don't know what you think, but I, I think this, there's lots to do here, right? Okay. Yes. Sorry, I've been looking at your trade plot. Not my, my Michael Jordan. Well, the one you wrote, yeah. Yes. Um, it, it seems like one could try to understand this kind of using the thing you were saying before, using NTK. It's a loss that depends only on the outputs of the network. There's no regularization on the parameters. And so do, do you have any sense, like, um, if there's some kind of... But here, I mean, oh, I, yeah, no, I, no, there is no work on, with NTK on this. That's pretty much sure, because we really looked through the literature. I mean, we Googled every single combination, NTK and underserved server robust, so <laughs> nothing, right? So that's why we started working on it. Um, but that aside, um, I mean, you still, this is in this double optimization thing where you do a bit parameters, but yeah, I have to think whether there is an NTK formulation for this. So like, I'm just wondering yeah. if you change cross entropy to mean squared error, try to take a very wide network where you, if you can understand what happens at infinite width. To the so so let, me, let, me, let me actually say that when I will present our, you know, our NTK way of optimizing, um, Somebody shaking, no, it's not Nikos, okay, I'm just looking, whenever I say something wrong, but I don't even know where he is, oh, there, okay. So anyway, so we did try this in the inner, in the inner uh, loop for our kernel stuff. We did try it to it. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll say a word about this okay. in a second, yes. yes. Uh, for yes. tracing, uh, are you proposing a way to analyze these? Uh, what, what was the question exactly? Yeah, the question is, can you analyze this if you change cross entropy to mean square error? I think the problem is, uh, when you try to find uh, the perturbation, the most constant perturbation, it's the, the, the root of the problem trying to analyze. Yeah. I mean, it's a min max, right? So it's, it's not these things are tricky, but you know, I have to so. Anyway, so just I hope you are all appalled by the abysmal state of the art and incited to do research in this area. There is um, something, this is actually partly IPFL and other um, people have established a standardized kind of benchmark. So you, not everybody does something weird, uh, this is a nice resource because they, I don't know who does it, but it's tremendous work where they, you know, depending on the perturbation and depending on the data set, they have a leaderboard for all these kind of attacks and all these defenses and all that stuff. And always, the, the I don't know who updates this, but the latest state of the art appears here and they rank it and, you know, it's exciting, I guess. All right, so coming back now to, I want to come back to the features. Uh, in a second. So let me let me um, step back now with this. This is done, and we're going back to the features because it's very cute and also relates to things that Nikos and I did that I wanted to show you. Um, Wait, sorry, could you say again how the, the, uh, the early stopping idea fits into this text? So what I want to say is, so people, people do this adversarial training, and then they show, oh, my trades is better than adversarial training. But when you look at it, deeper and you use a validation set for early stopping using this kind of idea that there is a sweet spot where it 
temporarily gets better and then it gets worse. And somehow if you if you manage to find that sweet spot, then all these things become more or less the same. I mean, I'm being very vague here. This is a whole paper that does really, I mean, I recommend having a look at that paper. It's, it's the reason for this. Um, anyway, just to say that there are lots of mysteries there, but let me come back to these features because it's very cute and also it relates to stuff that maybe the NTK can help us understand. So uh, this is work by, after this paper that I showed you with these robust and non-robust features, they did a really nice work in Monty Group. This is Ilias et al. I think it's New York's 19, if I'm not mistaken. So they did a really nice work where they just formalized this, and then they did something nice on images, which is really uh, beautiful, I think. I mean, it's, it was quite controversial. It's the paper, uh, uh, it's called Adversarial, what is it called? Adversarial um, examples are bugs and not, are features and not bugs. I think that's what it's called, but let me see what it is called. Adversarial examples are not bugs, they are features. Okay, so I, it's a bit, uh, it's a bit um, provocative, but here's what they do. So they observe all this thing with the features and they, they create kind of, they, they want to define what it actually means to be robust and what it means to be useful. So um, they stay in the binary case the same case I had like X is an R and uh, Y is a, is a label or something. And uh, they make some assumptions. They assume that our function is mean zero and variance one. Never mind. I mean, just some technical assumptions. And then they say that a feature, okay? So let's, let's first say what a feature is. Generally, a feature, right? We have to think what it means. is basically a function from... Uh, from the distribution, so this is our data distribution. So let's assume the data is as always, it's x and y, right? So a feature uh, looks at the data and maps it to some number, right? Just like we saw there with the average feature and the, and the zero feature. So that's a feature. And they say that f is rho useful. Rho is a parameter. So when is a feature useful? Obviously, when under the distribution of the data, under the data distribution, we have some correlation with the input. So let's assume here by the way, okay? <coughs> and data points or whatever. So if there's a correlation <coughs> with the input, uh, with the label, right? So if the feature correlates with the label, presumably it's useful, obviously, right? Because it helps us finding the label, okay? And uh, the row D is kind of the maximum of all these rows, such it remains useful, right? The maximum, let's say. All right, so that's a useful feature. And then uh, F is gamma, what did they say? Robustly, it has to be a bit uh, contorted, the definition, but otherwise it doesn't work. Useful. So it's still useful, but now robustly useful, like this x0 feature that we saw. Uh, if kind of this row d of f, so that it's kind of useful, bigger than zero, it has to be useful, um, and it has to be robust. So that means um, in our model, in the expectation over the data, as always, uh, in our epsilon ball, with our um, adversarial model, it remains useful even under perturbations. Right? So it's robust, excuse me, it's gamma robust for use, useful. So first it's useful, right? But even if you perturb it, it remains gamma useful. Right? So that's, uh, that's a, a useful feature, right? And then um, <clears throat> they say something, a feature could be useful and non-robust, useful and non-robust, which is interesting, which is the one that we saw this sum over the, x, the last axis. If, if what? Um, if f is rho, so let's, let's write it in our language, rho f is bigger than zero, so it's definitely useful. But, but not gamma robustly useful for all 
right? So no matter how hard you try, it doesn't remain useful if you perturb the thing, right? So this is the definition. And then they do a beautiful work where they try to disent... So, okay, so nice definition, and now what? And so then they do this beautiful work which has these nice pictures, and I'll, I'll see if I can describe it in a way... I tend to get it wrong, but Nico's sitting here, you can correct me. So then they try to say, how can I disentangle these features into the useful and the non-useful one, into the robust and the non-robust one, on a normal data set like CIFAR-10. Okay, so that's, that's what they do. And so how would they do it? How do they go about this? So I don't know, I have to raise something because I do want to show a picture. Maybe I showed a picture already. So um, how do they do it? So they want to create, so here is a frog, and the frog presumably has robust features and non-robust features. And so they find, I will describe how, they find a way to extract from that frog the robust features, okay? And they prove that this thing is kind of consisting of robust features by training a normal classifier on it, not adversarial training, normal training, and they show that it remains, that it's robust, this classifier. Okay, let me say it again. So they take a frog, the frog has both useful, excuse me, both robust and non-robust features. Okay. Then they do something which I'll describe in a second. So they make the frog robust, which presumably means they throw away all the non-robust features. Okay. So this is a robust frog, even if you're not aware of it, but yes. And they prove that it's robust, or kind of the proof of principle is that they can train a normal classifier on it. Right? Not, a, not adversarial training, nothing. And it will, it will have good robust accuracy. You following? Right? And so what's the secret procedure? It's not so difficult. So this, just keep it in your mind, but I have to erase it now. Or oh, let me keep the feature. So what are their features? I mean, they can't quite do a lot of things. So it's a little bit of backwards reasoning. Here. It's, it's, it goes a little bit like this, the reasoning, but it's nice nonetheless. So, um, so what do they say is a robust feature? They say, okay, if I have a classifier, here's my classifier, here's my neural net, and then here's the last layer before my fully connected layer where I put it into, into 10 classes. I don't know how that goes. You know, the fully connected one that puts it into these 10 classes, whatever, one frog and not frog, whatever. Okay, so they, they, they use this next to last layer, which people like to use also for all kinds of other things, um, as their features. So they say a feature is basically the activation of each of the neurons of the last layer. Okay. I mean, these are clearly features in the sense that they map the input to a real. So, sure, they're features, and presumably they kind of represent the data, and presumably some of them are robust and some of them are non-robust. Right? Presumably the classifier uses them all and because it's, they made it to the last layer. That's the reasoning, okay? So far so good? And then instead of using a classifier, they use a robust classifier, which means one that they obtain from adversarial training. So CR is a robust, is a robust classifier. So again, I told you the reasoning is a bit like this, but it's very nice, robust classifier. Right. So then the assumption is presumably all these features are robust, because it's a robust classifier, you can't fool it. So, um, and then what they do is they take these images, let me write it down properly, and they minimize. So then this, these, this, let's call this function G. So this is a G is a vector that maps the input right, to these n neurons. Okay, so G is the vector of all features. Right? So then they minimize, in order to get the robust features out of that frog, they take the frog, so they take G of x. This is the features of the frog. Okay? And then they minimize, they produce a robust frog by minimizing the L2 loss with respect to uh, kind of they minimize over all xr in some neighborhood. In some neighborhood. In the canal of some way. Okay, so what are they doing? They're taking the frog. Presumably these are all the robust features of the frog. I'm glossing over some details. It's worth reading the paper, it's beautifully written, at least that piece. I mean you can it was just two pages or one page. So they take the frog, right? Presumably these are all robust features. And then they move the frog, 
they move it epsilon away, so they must uh, remove all the non, I mean, in order to classify, you can't use the non-robust feature of the frog because you've moved away, they're kind of gone. And so what remains is the robust frog. Okay, all right? Right, and they do this, and they produce this robustified data set of all these frogs. There it is. Okay, so ignore this for a second. So here is the airplane, here is the robust airplane, here is the ship, the robust ship, and so on and so forth. Because there it is. I mean, it's always instructive to stare at images. And then here's what they do, right? So on the normal data set, on CIFAR 10, before any standard training, you get nice accuracy, standard accuracy, and you basically dead the moment you have to be robust. Right? So this is the accuracy, the robust accuracy. Okay? And then it, they do adversarial training. And we, as we know, the accuracy goes down, the robustness goes up, very nice. And then they produce this data set here, this robustified data set. And then they do standard training on the robustified data set. Okay? And when they do it, look, they, they, I mean, okay, it's not fully, but it's pretty robust. Okay? So that's, that's what they did to show that the, how can you disentangle these features in the frog. Is that clear, more or less? All right, and the last column, just to that you don't die out of um, you know, wanting to know about knowing, here they do the same thing, but they use here, they use a normal classifier, not a robust one, okay? And there somehow, basically, it doesn't work. So if you, if you don't robustify your classifier, if you don't tell your classifier to only look at robust features, then this procedure won't help you, okay? That's what it shows the last one there, okay? Is that, is that clear? All right, so let me, they do one more thing. Um, I do want to get to some material, so let me just uh, maybe say it in words. They do one more thing. They also show that you can actually train a classifier just on non-robust features. So they say, they also want to prove that inside this dog, there are features that we can't see, they're non-robust, but they're still useful to train a dog. Right? And so what they do is they basically take another image, a cat, right? and then they try to, they mislabel the cat, so they call the cat dog, okay? So they take a cat, they change the label to dog, okay? And then they try with the neural net again, with small perturbations on the cat, right? They try to move the cat towards a dog with a loss function, but they only allow small perturbations, okay? So let me just write it, I'll write down one line because I do want to go on. So what they do is um, they produce a perturbation, so they move the cat by a perturbation, which is the argmin, argmin of the loss function of the classifier of x plus delta and the wrong label, uh, target label, target. So target label, they took a cat, the target is a dog. They want to make a cat a dog, okay? So this is a cat, okay, just for you. This is the cat picture. This is the dog label. And then they only use small perturbations to get the classifier classified as a dog. The classifier presumably has already learned to distinguish cats and dogs. And here kind of the classifier will reveal which non-robust features it has used. Okay, and they produce another data set like this which is totally mislabeled because for us humans, this tiny perturbation is invisible. We still see a cat. The machine sees a dog, we see a cat. Presumably it only has learned the non-robust features. And they basically show that on this kind of weird data set, which to us looks totally wrong, the classifier still, when you train on it, gets 63% accuracy. And this is not standard training. Okay? Nice, right? I mean, it's all not very scientific, but it's cute, presumably. Um, Right, so I already told you this all remains, and now let me go to back to our work with the neural tendon kernel. Um, so I remind you that I, in data distillation, I, I showed you twice, I think, this KIP algorithm, which uh, distills data in order to train a neural net uh, efficiently. Right? And so we want to use that same idea uh, to train a neural net uh, to train data that is robust. So in other words, remember what Madhuri did. They did some weird procedure to produce data such that when you train on this data, you're robust, right? 
But they did it in a, I mean, I don't know if you like that way, it's nice, but it's a very roundabout way that required a robust machine, right? So that's not exactly um, what we want to do uh, because we don't have a robust machine, presumably. So what, what is the adversarial training? What adversarial training does, right? It's minimizing the parameters such that it maximizes over all, and this is always the whole data here, right? And being a bit imprecise, here's our perturbations, right? Such that the loss function of f, excuse me, the loss function of f on x prime on the perturbed data with the parameters and trained on training data, uh, so we, we minimax. So this is adversarial training. So adversarial training, as I said, we optimize uh, our train. I mean, we, I gotta put this here. Yeah, so we're trying to maximize the, minimize the parameters to maximize the robust loss, basically. So in, instead of doing this, our idea was to use kernel. So we were going to the kernel model. And what we'll do is, instead of this, we'll minimize our training data we'll minimize, we do something on the training data, we'll distill training data such that it maximizes um, on the test data in our epsilon ball here, this loss here. So adversarial training, I have, this is I'm just trying to make the formulations kind of look similar, but adversarial training is parametric model, and we do this double optimization in order to optimize robust loss. We're turning the question around. We know we can't do standard training on the data set. We know from the Madri result, even a support vector machine will fail. However, we could modify the training data, extract robust data with this procedure here, such that when we train on that data, we Whenever we try to you know, test it on a validation set, when we perturb the validation set, we're still minimizing the loss. Okay? Okay? All right, and so let me maybe, instead of rhyming it, let me flash this from, from, uh, from the paper because it might be uh, easier to see. So we have our training data set, that's the one we want to optimize. So just like Madri did, we want to produce a data set that is has robust features so that when we train on it, we, we are robust, right, basically. That's the idea. And we wanna produce out of, we wanna produce a robust data set. So we sample from the training. We start with our original images, CFAR 10, right? And then what we do is, we have to do it a little bit in batches also because kernels, as you know, the issue is that everything is quadratic or super uh, cubic in the, in the dimension, so we, we take some test data, some validation data. We perturb this test data, right? So we do our PGD, several PGD steps, projected gradient descent, as I showed you last time. And then we write down, this is what the, the kernel would output if it had been trained on this data. Right? And then it's evaluated on this data, and we're messing with this data. Okay, we do PGD steps, and then we project back into our epsilon ball, and then we update the training data by differentiating through this loss. Okay? So what do we do? Again, let me say it again. We're trying to produce a robust training set, which we call XS. X, uh, it's called the source set. I, I think of it as synthetic, whatever. S is a nice letter. So this is our training set here, XS, such that when we evaluate it on a test set, on a validation set, I should say, even if we perturb that validation set adversarially, we still do well. And then this, we write this down, basically you can write this down as an expression with your kernels, and then you can take a gradient with respect to the training data, right? You propagate through, you, up, you can also update the labels. Doesn't matter that much, actually, we show. And you, you repeat this, and this way you produce a robustified data set. Yes, 
So which NPK do you use here? Ah, so that's an excellent question. So we, we basically, our approach is we use what we can. So what does it mean? For MNIST, MNIST uh, we did 10 uh, multi-class. We only used fully connected ones, so five layers, up to five layers. And Nikos has to correct me because he has to remember these experiments. But we used fully connected NTK, and it still transferred well to normal, normal, but even convolutional architectures. But this is for a trained network or an untrained network? Like, like, this is a you, This is an NTK, right? I know, but you could train a network and then take its NTK. I mean, the NTK is the. Ah, you mean you set. want to take the, the the empirical one? No, here we use really the analytical expression of the infinitely oh, wide. I see. You sorry, sorry. This is really analytical here. I mean, this I is see. the infinitely wide kernel that we can love, cherish, right, and that we can analytically, literally, analytically take a derivative. With. I see. We can really take these derivatives because, in the simplest case, this is just R cos in a product, R is in a product, right? Whatever. So. I mean, in principle, you could take the derivative of the empirical one, which is numerically. Yeah, we do, we do that. I mean, somewhere we did that too at some point. Uh, and, and Nikos did all kinds of derivative. I mean, yes, we could. But uh, we, let's just do this nice thing. So for MNIST, we used fully connected. For CIFAR, we did CIFAR only, uh, correct me, Nikos, only with two classes. We did binary CIFAR only, no? Oh, we did all CIFAR. So why don't we do for CIFAR, we use convolutional architectures. Why don't we not? We just decided MNIST is not interesting. So for CIFAR, we also use convolutional architectures. Is there a rich parameter in a kernel regression? Yes, so I'm sorry. I, I glossed over a lot of things. In particular, there is a rich parameter here, which is kind of being tuned. It doesn't really matter that much, but yes, we, we actually do kernel regression. I mean, there's lots of, I'm, I'm, simple, I'm oversimplifying tremendously here, but uh, nonetheless, um, so that's what we do. And note, there's one difference here to data set distillation. Now, this data set here, we don't want it to be small. We don't care whether it's one per class, 10 per class, 100 per class. In fact, you know, the more the better, we know that. So now we're not in the regime where we're trying to extract a small data set. Now we're in the regime where we try to extract a big one, and then we extract it, and then we hand it to the world and say, now train on this one and you'll be robust, okay? Just like Marjorie did. I mean, he took the frog, he made it robust, he did this to all the animals, he handed it to the world and said, please train and you'll be robust, right? Kind of. All right, clear? All right, so um, just because of pretty pictures, um, so these are our robustified images. Not sure what you can get out of it, but it looks cute. They still look like the images, but they are now robust, presumably. And uh, so we got very excited by this, and I have to say this is work in progress, why? Um, because we are, in fact, really robust. Um, these are our, this is the, our stuff, and this is the baseline of adversarial training for a particular convolutional architecture, I think four layer confnet or something. Um, with various effects. So we're comparing, and you can see that, first of all, our clean accuracy is kind of better um, for the simple, co I mean, for various architectures, but we're also, we're really competitive with this adversarial training baseline, so we're really excited. Uh, there is a bit of a problem, again, I, I can talk more hours about this, but I, I won't because I won't want to get to some other stuff too. Um, but the issue here is that um, this is against PGD attacks. So remember, PGD attacks are the ones that then compute your kernel, your 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 um, derivative, right, of your model, and then perturb you in the worst direction. And and there we're good. It turns out we fail against other attacks. And I again, I can explain this offline. And we seem to understand slowly why, because our kernel kind of puts itself into an area where there's no gradient, right? It kind of runs into some sort of place. And you know, we're trying now to find other as Boris was alluding, maybe other other. Um, Loss functions, other, you know, there's there's lots of tricks to try. So this is work in progress. We just submitted it to this. It, it's just in this workshop of ICML, but it's not yet because we, we're still working on it. But I thought it was amazing. One thing that is amazing is that we use relatively simple, infinitely wide kernels, even for fully connected architectures, and it kind of transfers well even to convolutional normal. So this is not kernel, right? These are results for uh, real kind of real world uh, neural nets. Right? So so there's this interesting transfer. Um, that you know, Boris and Yasama perturbations are trying to compute that we, of course, just assume for granted in some sense, and it works. Um, here are a few more pretty images. So this is uh, how our robustified MNIST looks, and this is how robustified CIFAR-10 looks. All right, um, I want to say one more thing. There is one more, uh, when we Googled NTK and adversarial, there's actually one more paper that does similar stuff uh, just for a different kind of problem. So let me mention this because it's just cute. 
Uh, it's called uh, poisoning attacks. Who has heard of poisoning attacks? Oh, some people, okay, but I'll say it anyway. So poisoning attacks is very simple. Um, I, I, I mean, when I read the justifications, I, I'm not sure I'm buying them, but it's a cute problem nonetheless. So the idea is that there's all this data around the images, the music, and we're putting it online, somebody puts it online, um, but let's assume we actually don't want you to scrape it from the web and then train a neural net on it. For some reason, whatever, there's some commercial interest that I don't want, or whatever privacy, I mean, whatever, whatever reasons, um, I want you to, when, when you take my data, I want you to fail when you train on it. Is the problem clear? So it's just like kind of the inverse adversarial problem. So what, let me write it down. What do I want to do? I want to poison my data in a way that you don't generalize on it. Is that clear? Is that motivation? Presumably, you shouldn't be able to tell that the data was poisoned or something. And you shouldn't be able to tell. So we're using our uh, uh, beautiful uh, infinity norm, which is tiny. And I mean, maybe you can tell it's not secret. It's not about secrecy, but you want the data to still be usable. So if it's pretty pictures of your family that you put online, you still want to recognize grandpa, right? So you want to poison it a little bit, but it should still be consumable. All right? So that's the idea. Okay. I presume you, you, you're kind of buying the motivation more than me. So what do we want? So here is our here is our training data. This is like the photo of grandpa and so on, right? With the labels. And what we want to do, we want to poison it. I mean, poison in a good sense here. We want to poison it. So what does it mean? We want to presumably add a small perturbation. This is all of the whole data set. Let's keep the labels intact, right? So we want to poison this thing such that uh, basically when you and this this as always lives in some small neighborhood, right? So epsilon one, zero. So we tiny perturbation. So you can still recognize going far such that. So what are we trying to do? We are trying to do, so this is our validation set. So we trained the neural net and now we want it to work on other photos. So here's the validation set. This is what we want to. And we want to find the worst poison. So that means argmax, 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 in the epsilon one. Right. of the loss function of the neural net that we have trained on the training data, EXT, with our whatever parameters, so argmax, sorry, did I write this wrong? Yes, so no, I wrote, wrote this right, so here, with our labels, okay, and where does this one come, come from? So this is the subject to that this thing here, from training the neural net on our training data, argmin of training of the loss function of our neural net, f, x, s, and here we are poisoning it, right? <coughs> All right, let's see if that's clear. That's why my brackets are closed. Okay, so what are we doing? We're training, we're trying to find the worst perturbation such that when we train our neural net, that when we start evaluating it outside, we totally don't generalize. So that means we're trying to find the worst thing so that when we train on it, we don't generalize. You, you're with me? And of course, there's like all kinds of approaches, so it's a well studied area. There's uh, all kinds of things. But this, I mean, if you stare at it, it just begs for NTK or some kernel of, I don't know, does it beg for? So it's very easy now to write down they call this, oh, I should say, this is absolutely, I don't want to appropriate it. This is not mine at all. This is by these people. And what is it? It's ICML21. Right, so, sorry. Um, so it begs for the NTK, and they call this Neural Tangent Generalization Attacks, NTGA. NTGA. So if you think about it, what they do is they devise a similar algorithm to our algorithm, to the KIP one, the, the, sorry, to the adversarial one. So basically, this their algorithm, what they do is, with their the same uh, derivatives through the kernels as we do, in this epsilon ball, as always, right? Um, here's the training data. Here is the kernel formulation of this problem, right? 
So this is the kernel at test. This is the kernel at train. On the labels, minus one. Oh, there's already, let's put the minus one here. More or less. Okay? So just like in our uh, formulation, let me go back to that one. 